Welcome to the next talk. Uh, we're going to have Philip Jones talking about uh, ASDI, the Synchronous Server Gateway Interface. So please give him a nice round of applause. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to introduce ASCII today, the Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. Uh, but just to get an idea, how many people already know what ASCII is? Oh, there's a few. Good. So hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a very good idea of what ASCII is, if it's a good talk. And uh, yeah, but before I get into that, just a little about me. Uh, if you want to follow along with the slides locally, you can find them on pgjones.dev. Uh, you can also find me as pgjones on GitLab, GitHub, and Medium. And it's slightly more complicated on Twitter. There's an extra D. Uh, somebody else had the name. But there we are. So. Uh, I'm going to introduce ASCII, but to do that, I'm going to step back and introduce Whiskey. Uh, I suspect most of the people in this will in this room uh, know what Whiskey is, but if you don't and you've done any web stuff in Python, you've almost certainly used it. Uh, I'll explain what it is if you don't know. But to go back to when Whiskey was introduced in 2003, quite a time ago now, there was quite a uh, an ecosystem of Python web servers already, uh, such as Zope, Kyoxi, Webware, etc. Now. One of the issues at the time was that these, uh, these frameworks differ in their API and their functionality, but they're all very distinct. You couldn't take parts of Twisted and use it with Zope, at least as I understood at the time. So you've got to make a choice. You've got to use one or the other. And this kind of feeds directly into the motivation for Whiskey at the time, which I'll just read out because I think it like, uh, summarizes it very succinctly, which is Python currently boasts a wide variety of web application frameworks such as Zope, Kyoxi, Webware, Skunkware, PSO, and Twisted Web, if I've pronounced them all right. This wide variety of choices can be a problem for new Python users, because generally speaking, their choice of web framework will limit their choice of usable web servers and vice versa. And so this was uh, seen in, in 2003, and the PEP 333, if you want to read it, came about to introduce Whiskey. And what Whiskey is, is a standard interface that allows you to separate the server code, which is mostly about passing and understand the HTTP, certainly at that time, from the application code, which is mostly about how you kind of root and couple the, your business logic into your web server. And uh, Whiskey, which stands for the Web Server Gateway Interface, is, is quite simple in principle. What you have to do as your application is define it as a callable uh, that takes two arguments. The first argument, environ, describes the request and the environment that the server or the framework's running in. And the second argument, start response, is a callable, which you call to start the response, uh, in this case with the status and some headers, and then you return or yield the body. So it's quite simply defined. And that allowed the servers, which again is mostly about passing and understand the HTTP, to be separated from the framework, which is more about the API and how it's used. So, I think it's fair to say that Whiskey has been a, a really great success for Python. There's a lot of Whiskey frameworks. Uh, they differ in terms of whether you want to go full batches included like Django or something very minimal like Flask or Bottle and everything in between. And so you've got real choice there in what kind of API you want to use. And just as a note here, because Whiskey uh, sounds a lot like Whiskey, a lot of them are named after receptacles like Bottle and Flask and Falcon, etc. So that's not only something I realized recently. Uh, on the other side, there's the Whiskey servers. I think there are less of these because it's more defined, it's more constrained by the protocols. Uh, but there are three big ones I know of, Unicorn, New Whiskey, and Apache. I think the main kind of feature you'd go for here is how they manage concurrency. Uh, that's, what, that's what you're going to really care about when choosing these. But again, it's given users of and uh, Py the Python ecosystem a lot of choice, which is the great thing about Whiskey. So over the roughly uh, 15 years, maybe a bit more, that Whiskey's been about, it started to show its age. And I think this is mostly because of changes in uh, the kind of web systems around it rather than Whiskey itself. So of the limitations, the first one I'll mention is that it has no uh, official way to deal with web sockets. In fact, as you saw that callable, it's a request response cycle. It expects you to return a response and be done. Uh, whereas, of course, with WebSockets, that connection is going to stay open, and you're just going to send messages back and forth. 
Now there is an unofficial workaround, which is almost a wrapper around the socket, but it depends again on what concurrency framework you're using. So it's not uh, standardized. For the same reason, it doesn't really say much about HTTP2 in terms of concurrency. You can use HTTP2, it's just a request response cycle, but you've got to decide on top of it how you're going to make it concurrent because HTTP2 is concurrent. You can't get away from it. Carrying on, you can't use the async and await keywords. Uh, they've only recently been introduced. And I think this is more the fact that async code and sync code doesn't really work well together, but you can't really use it with uh, with whiskey servers because the, the event loops, if you have them, fight each other. And finally, I haven't mentioned it here, but the request body, you may want to stream it into your server. So you might want to get it in chunks. And there's some support for that coming in whiskey, but generally speaking, uh, the whiskey standard is defined that you get the whole body and then you pass it into the callable in the environment. So you've got to, the server's got to have it all before it can call your application. So these limitations, I think, of what started to motivate async web frameworks, which has been quite an explosion of in the last few years. And I think the first one that came about was AOHTP, which I've shown a little example here. So you can see it meets a lot of these, these desires, these limitations. First, you can use the async await keywords. You can await the DB call, you can see there. Secondly, although it's not shown here, it does do web sockets as well. Uh, you can stream the request body. And although AOHTP doesn't say anything about HTTP2, it may do in the future. And some of the frameworks and servers I'm going to talk about in a minute do. So looking at where we are today, it, I would say it's quite similar to where we were or where the community was in 2003. There's quite a few async frameworks. And these logos are AOHTP, uh, Black Sheep, Sanic, uh, Japronto, and Vibora. Uh, so some of them, I don't think Japronto or Vibora are maintained anymore, but all of these have kind of made uh, a name in the, in the ecosystem, mostly because in, the, in these cases, just how better performance they provide, which I'll come to later. But that's kind of what's made people excited alongside these features. But uh, especially for these frameworks, because you can't use them together, you can't mix and match, I think they make for the perfect uh, motivation for ASCII. And if I took that original motivation for whiskey and change it very slightly and say that Python currently boasts a wide variety of async web frameworks, such as AOHTP, SANIC, Black Sheep, Gioponto, and Vibora, this wide variety of choices can be a problem for new Python users because generally speaking, their choice of web framework will limit their choice of usable web servers and vice versa. I think this goes beyond just new Python users as well. I think this is a limitation to all of us. I think this is good motivation to want a new standard to come about that works in the asynchronous world. And that standard, I hope to convince you, should be ASCII. And ASCII stands for the Asynchronous Server Gateway Interface. I think it's so named to make the parallels to Whiskey. Uh, and I'll try and, as we go into this, I'll try and say what my involvement is. It's been a small part, but I'll try and say where my biases come through. But ASCII itself is again about defining your application as a callable, but in this case, it's a coroutine function. So it's async by, by default. And this time, the callable takes three arguments. The scope, which is very similar to the environment. It tells you about the connection in this case, because it's not necessarily just a HTTP request. And there's two extra callables, a receive and a send. So you, you as an application have to receive messages from the server and then send them back. And you can see in this example, they're all asynchronous. So it all works in the concurrent framework. And the link there you can find in the slides I'll just go to, that's the specification as it's written out. So to give you an example of what it looks like, so the whiskey example I showed earlier would simply respond with a 200 response with a very short body that just says hello world uh, to whatever request it got, as with this piece of code here. So the big differences are that you have to now check that it's a HTTP request, so you're not responding to a WebSocket, say, with a, a response, because it wouldn't make any sense. And then, much like with Whiskey, you start by sending the response information, the status and the headers, so you start the response. And then you stream or send off the, the body. And in this case, it's just hello world, so it's quite simple. So this, I think, is roughly the same as the Whiskey one you saw a few minutes ago. So I'm going to go into more detail now about 
what ASCII is and all the different parts of it. Thanks. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the development of it, so ASCII came about through, I think, the Django's channels development, which was, is it, well, I think, the ultimate aim of this is to make Django async. And the first version of ASCII separated the server and the application by process. It was quite complicated, and you can thankfully just ignore it. So if you do manage to find anything that references ASCII 1, you can just forget about it. Uh, then there was ASCII 2 which, and ASCII 3, which are very similar. They're, they're roughly the same. It's just ASCII 3 is a bit simpler and cleaned up. And I'm only going to talk about ASCII 3. But if you come across ASCII 2, basically anything that supports ASCII 3 will probably support ASCII 2 at this time. So there we are. OK, so I'm going to go into a, a bit of detail uh, to get you hopefully really know how ASCII works. So the first thing that Callable gets as an application is the scope. And the scope is telling you about the connection. And for a HTTP request, that's going to tell you about the HTTP request. So uh, every ASCII message has a type. So this type is HTTP. Uh, it's going to have a HTTP version. And then it's going to define the request. So that's the method, the scheme, the path, the query string, and the headers. And then a little bit about the connection itself, the client address and the server address. And then a bit about the environment, which is the root path. So this is what you get in the scope. And uh, this, is, this is pretty much it. And it's, it's very similar to the Whiskey environment. So you as an application get sent this when a client connects to the server. Then you as an application are going to wait for messages off the server uh, to know what you want to do. So what you're likely to receive from the server to begin with is a message that says that there's a HTTP request body coming through. And in this case, uh, to demonstrate streaming, the first message you get is just says hello, but then it's telling you there's more body expected. So you're probably, as an application, going to expect the next message to come from the server to be something similar until you've run out of body. In this case, you get the final part world, and it tells you there's no more body coming. So now you, as an application, can start sending your response. So the first thing you're going to send is the basic information about the response, the status, and the headers. And then you'll stream out the body. In this case, because I've, I've run out of slide space, it's just one message, which is just hi. And so you send that off. And then the client's going to disconnect from the server, most likely. And so you receive from the server, when that's happened, a disconnect message. And for a HTTP message, this is basically all you need to get right for ASCII to have an ASCII application run. So moving on to WebSockets. So it's all asynchronous. Like I said earlier, it supports HTTP and WebSockets. So with a WebSocket connection, the scope is a little bit different this time. First, it says it's a WebSocket connection in the type. Uh, the connection information is similar. You get told the scheme, the path, query string, and headers. But you also get told the subprotocols, which matter for the connection. Uh, a little bit about the connection, the client server addresses, and then finally, the root path. So again, when a, a client connects to the server, you get called with this scope. And again, you as an application are going to expect some messages off the server and then going to respond to them. And the first thing you need to do as a WebSocket is decide that you want to accept that connection and turn it into a fully WebSocket connection. So you send this back to the server. So now it is a WebSocket connection. Uh, you perhaps will receive a bytes frame from the uh, client through the server, or maybe a text frame. So you could get both of these. And you can send back any frame you want at any time as well. And then again, much like with uh, uh, HTTP, you've got to decide when you want to close the connection. So you can send a close back. And then once it's closed, you get told that it's dis the client's disconnected from the server. So again, this is roughly all you need for an ASCII application. So there's one more part of ASCII that matters as a kind of protocol stage. And this is the, one, the part where I start to have been more involved in ASCII. So this is more of my bias. But one of the issues I found with Whiskey is that you can't really decide that you need to prepare something before the server should start receiving requests. So a good example of this is if you're going to connect to a database, you probably want to create a connection pool and create that before you receive a single request. Otherwise, it's just going to add latency to that very first request. If you use Flask, you probably already get this with the before first request. So the ASCII lifespan protocol allows the server to send to you that it's ready. Uh, so it sends you a, a lifespan startup. And you as an application set up, and you send back to the server that you're ready when you say startup complete. And from that point on, the server can start accepting connections. So if you're 
If you've got, say, a load balanced uh, set of servers, you can just roll them over easier. Equally, when you're shutting down gracefully, there's the, there's the opposite on shutdown. So that's lifespan. Then there are two extensions to ASCII, both of which I've been quite involved with. The first of which is server push. So for HTTP2 connections, you can decide as a server you want to push your response to the client before the client asks for it. Uh, you often want to do this when you know the client's going to request something. A good example being if the client's requested a HTML file, they're probably going to ask for the CSS and JavaScript next. So send it to the client before they ask and save a bit of latency. So that's a server push. So as an application, you simply look for the scope and look to see if it's got an extension that says it allows server push. And then you can send this message to the server saying, server push this to the client. The next, the next extension is to be able to send a different response when a WebSocket connection request is made. So when WebSockets are kind of made or the connections are attempted, it starts with a HTTP message that asks for an upgrade. Now, most libraries will allow you to accept that message or just close the connection if you don't want to. So what this extension allows you to do is instead say, I want to reject the upgrade, but with this particular message. So you can be a bit more informative, maybe say that they don't have the right credentials or that the request is badly formed or something like that. So it's again, you just need to look in the extensions. And uh, if you're wondering about the empty dictionary, that's just so there's extra options. It's not a typo. But uh, so you look for this extension, and then you can send messages back to the server like you would for a HTTP message, only they're prefixed now with WebSocket. So it's exactly the same. You just send back a HTTP response. So that, in a bit of a rush, is, is pretty much the whole ASCII spec. And you can go read the details for the, for the exact. But that's pretty much all of it. So much like Whiskey, I think this is starting to have a really good effect on the community. Like there are a lot of uh, ASCII frameworks starting to exist now. Uh, so just to name a few, there's Quart, FastAPI, Responder, Starlet, and Django Channels. I think Django itself is becoming async. I, I know a bit less than this, but it looks like it probably will. Uh, my bias here is I, I work on Quart. So uh, uh, Quart's very Flask-like, as are most of these. So, in terms of the ASCII features I've just talked about, uh, there's, a, there's a strong bias here because the, the extensions are my interest, so I've, I've written them. <laughs> but uh, basically, all of them work for the, the basic ASCII spec. So you could go use any of these with the ASCII servers, and you'll have a good time. Looking at the ASCII servers, as far as I know, there's currently four, uh, or four main ones. So there's Hypercorn, Uvicorn, Daphne, and Mangum. Again, I've got a bias here because I write Hypercorn. Uh, but in terms of the other, so Mangan is a serverless one, if you're interested in that. I think Daphne is very uh, popular in the Django community. Uvicorn's the most uh, performant. And my bias is I would say Hypercorn has the most features. But again, the features I'm, only I'm really interested in. So there we are. But uh, in terms of these features, there's support for HTTP2 in Hypercorn and Daphne. Uh, you could do HTTP2 WebSockets in Hypercorn, which I don't think you could do elsewhere. And then the server push and uh, HTTP WebSocket responses as well. So those are the features that I'm interested in are, are in my ASCII. But most people are actually more interested in the kind of performance. Indeed, for the ASCII frameworks and the async frameworks in general, this has been one of the kind of most exciting things, it seems, for the community. Uh, so to say a little about that, if we look at the last tech in power, at least I think this is the last tech in power, if we look at the top 10 Python ones, six of those are ASCII-based. Indeed, the top two are ASCII. Uh, two more are async, and it's only uh, Tornado and Bottle that are whiskey. So I think ASCII's made quite a, quite a name for itself here, and whiskey as well. So uh, hopefully, you've got a very good idea about what ASCII is. And uh, hopefully, I've convinced you that it's the right standard for the community to adopt. And I think I might have time for questions. Cool. So if you have anything to ask him. Hey. Uh, I was just wondering, um, with this new system, because I'm used to Flask, but I never used any of this, um, are we able to use less JavaScript now? Because you know, we, the, the interaction that we have to build with JavaScript with things going back and forth, 
you know, with the reactive applications. Is it possible to do some of the stuff on the server now? Uh, I'm not like, I'm thinking like what Live View is doing with Elixir. You know? uh, so I'm not quite sure that it is, but maybe if, if, there's a, if there was an issue with WebSockets, which was easier to do in JavaScript, yeah, it's quite easy to do in, in Python now. So that, that might mean less JavaScript for you. OK, thanks. Any more questions? Have you heard anything from SANIC about implementing ASGI 3, I guess, would be the right question today? Yeah, so uh, they've been working on it. I'm told today from Tom, who I can't see, that, uh, hi, Tom, uh, that they're actually quite close. So I think there'll be an ASCII framework and maybe an ASCII server soon. Any more questions? Uh, so that was a very interesting overview. Thank you very much. What what do you think still needs kind of work? Where are the areas of the ASCII spec or the implementations that are most in need of uh, most of a need of improvement at the moment? Uh, I think it's actually had quite a bit of development now, so I think it's in quite a good shape. There's nothing uh, nothing that springs to my mind. I was speaking to Tom about it earlier. I don't think there's anything that springs to his mind either. So I think it's in a very good shape now. Any other questions? OK, then we're going up. Oh, sure. no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you, once another question. Oh, this is a um, silly question. Um, do I detect the influence of Swift on security in your naming of your ASCII server uh, Hypercorn? Uh, no, I don't actually know what okay, Swift on mind. security is. I thought I saw a pun that wasn't there. So, so it's uh, I, I use the Hyper Sans.io libraries mostly for it, and then I, I've tried to keep the interface as similar as I can to Junicorn, so that's where the name comes from. So ask you what that is. Um, thanks for the talk, really interesting. Um, so would this, this wouldn't be a drop-in replacement if you need a new framework. So let's say my particular stack, uh, Nginx, USG, Python, uh, F uh, Flask server, it would be a new framework and ASGI and then Nginx is HTTP2, so that would be a tip that could be a production stack, that kind of thing? Or? Yeah, I think this is more an issue with trying to build synchronous and asynchronous code together. I don't think it's really possible, so I think you have to choose to be async. Yeah, so that was my aim with Quart. So Quart is the Flask API we implemented with async await, so to make it easier. But most of them are very similar to Flask. So if you were to move to, say, Starlet, it would be quite a pleasant and easy experience for you. We have time for one more question, maybe. Hey, uh, I have a very simple question. Um, so when it comes to uh, the WSGI spec, it's very easy to remember PEP 333 and quadruple three. Uh, is there a PEP for ASGI? Uh, there isn't. There's been talk about writing one. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's progressed much recently, but I kind of I hope it will become a pep, but we shall see. You can just search for it as ASCII or ASCII ref, and uh, you should find it. There's a, I think I showed. So you can also take that link if you'd like. Okay. Anything else? We'll have. One more minute. Yep. Okay, let's give our speaker a nice warm applause, please. Thank you.